When making a video game, game developers use random numbers a lot for a variety of different reasons. And in this video, I'm gonna share with you a brand new way of using randomness to improve your games. To do this, we're gonna be using normal distributions. But before we start using them in the first place, it's important for us to understand what they are and how they work. A normal distribution looks like this and has two main parts. First, the mean. The mean describes the center of the distribution. So think about it as the average of all the values. And the mean is typically denoted with the Greek letter mu. Second is the standard deviation. And the standard deviation describes, I guess, the width of your distribution, commonly referred to in statistics as the variability. And the standard deviation is typically denoted with the Greek letter sigma. In statistics, there's this rule called the empirical rule, which says that in a normal distribution, approximately 68% of the data falls between one standard deviation below and above the mean, 95% for two standard deviations and 99.7 for three standard deviations. Once we have a mean and a standard deviation, we can do two main things with it. We can see how likely it is to get a value from a range of values, and we can also see what value we get when we have a specific probability. And in this video, we're gonna be concerned with the second option, and that's usually referred to as an inverse normal problem. Hopefully that made some sense, but remember, you don't have to be an expert on how all this stuff works in order to effectively use it. And speaking of effectively using it, Here's an example on how and where this technique can be incorporated. In the Ludum Dare 50 game jam, I made a game called Don't Touch the Circle. And in the game, there are two types of enemies, small squares and big squares. This can get a little repetitive with only the two options, so we can change up the sizes using this method. Oh, and I'm only gonna be doing this with the big squares, so this line of code right here just prevents the little guys from spawning in. The first step is to make a new script called normal distribution. Next, you want to use the link in the description to copy and paste in the code. From there, I go in right after the enemy has been created and I make a variable called scale. And I set it equal to normal distribution dot random over normal distribution. I want to have the average size the same of what they already are. So I'll set the mean equal to one. And I think I'll have 68% of them have a scale between 0.8 and 0.12. So I'll set the standard deviation to 0.2. Then I'll pass in random.range, ranging from 0 to 10,001, as the last argument, to generate a random integer from 0 to 10,000. Then I'll set the transform.local scale equal to a new vector 3 with the scale variable for the x, y, and z components. After testing it out, I noticed there was just a little bit too much variability in the sizes of the squares, meaning some are too big and some are too small. So back in Visual Studio, I changed the standard deviation from 0.2 to 0.05. And after testing that out, I felt it wasn't really enough. So I changed the standard deviation to 0.1 and felt like it was a much better fit for the game. And make sure you play around with the values for the standard deviation so you have something that's a good fit for your game. But sometimes you can actually find mean and standard deviations on the internet. For instance, if I'm using this technique for adult male heights, I can literally just search up in Google mean and standard deviation of adult male heights and get exactly what I'm looking for. There are also plenty of other ways you can use normal distributions to improve your games. For example, if you have a weapon that does varying amounts of damage, set it up to use a normal distribution. And the same thing goes for something like health. If you want it to vary, use a normal distribution. And now, for the last part of the video, I wanted to explain how the code actually works. Personally, I think it's important to understand what your code is doing, but it does get a little mathy, and if you're not into that stuff, I understand. So remember, the function basically just does an inverse normal problem, which means it outputs a right bound that gives a specific area under a curve of a normal distribution with a left bound of negative infinity. Now, you could try to understand all the advanced calculus that's going on here, or you can just use tables. And now, these tables are really helpful, but they only work for something called a standard normal distribution, which is just a fancy way of saying a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. But luckily for us, we get to do something called standardizing to get a z-score. And all a z-score is, is the number of standard deviations that a value is from our mean. And the formula for a z-score is z equals x minus mu over sigma. Okay, so with that additional knowledge, let's jump into the code. The first thing that the function does is create a z-table if it hasn't been created already. I use the dictionary for the z-table because they're fast and I can associate one p-value acting as the key with one z-score acting as the value. Next, we convert our random number from zero to 10,000, we put in as the argument into a decimal. Then we check to see whether the p is less than 0.5. If it is, we set p equal to one minus p to get a value greater than 0.5. I'll explain why we did this in a little bit. After that, we start looping through our table. 
we first check to see if our original P is a key. And if it's not, we add 0.0001 to it and try again. The most spread out the p-values are is 0.004. So if the loop runs more than 50 times, something's wrong. And we need a break out of the loop to avoid an infinite loop crashing our game. Once our p-value is a key in the dictionary, we can stop increasing it. And when I was entering in the values for the z-table, I only did it from 0.5 and up because the normal distribution is perfectly symmetrical, so we only really need one side. With that in mind, if our original p is less than 0.5, that's basically just the z-score of a p-value of 1 minus p, but negative. And if our p-value was greater than 0.5 from the start, all we have to do is look up that z-score from the dictionary. And now that we have a z-score, we can get an actual value to return. By manipulating the z-score formula, we can see that we need to return mu plus z times sigma. And this should make sense, because remember, a z-score is just the number of standard deviations a value is from the mean. So we start with the mean and add the number of standard deviations times the value of the standard deviation. Thank you so much for watching. And if you felt confused at any point in this video, drop a comment, I'd love to help you out. And if you can think of any ways that I can improve the code, drop a comment and I can update it for everyone. And if any major changes are made, I'll put them down in a pinned comment or in the description. And if you're brand new here, first of all, welcome. And second, I have a lot of really fun game development content here on the channel. And if you're into that stuff, check it out. I'm sure you'll love it. And when you end up loving it, hit that subscribe button. Thanks. See you soon.